And first up, Odd Salon fellow Casey Selden will be coming to tell us about a daring desert discovery. Now, I think she's probably better traveled than her subject here, but I'm quite certain she's far less hapless. So welcome, Casey. Hi, everybody. Hi. My name is Casey. I am here to give you a story about a tongue twister that I was hoping that Stuart was going to take on, a Swiss chic spy's daring desert discovery. and. It's really a biography. So we're going to start with a little bit of an introduction. We're talking here about a fellow by the name of Johann Ludwig Burkhardt. But he grew up speaking mostly French, so he self-identified by his French name of uh, Jean-Louis or Louis. So that's what we're going to call him today. And we've got a lot to cover, so we're not going to linger on his bucolic upbringing in Switzerland, where his parents were friends of Goethe, and he was the son of a silk merchant. and grew up with silk ribbons coming out of his ears. We're definitely not gonna linger too long on his German upbringing or, or his German education where he studied philosophy because that's really important. We're gonna get right to his, like, his burning desires, his big dreams for his lifetime of going to London to get a government job. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Civil service, it's the way to go. And um, Britain is a big deal. He goes there with these big ideas, and apparently they were totally dashed. It's not an easy thing. He tries everything he can, gets no civil service jobs whatsoever, until he meets this guy. So here we have our meet cute with this fellow, <laughs> Sir Joseph Banks. His name might be familiar, he's a pretty fancy guy. This fellow was a naturalist. Um, he went on Joseph uh, Cook's first expedition, Captain James Cook's first expedition. He um, advised King George III. He was pals with Alexander von Humboldt, who's a favorite of this crowd, I'd say. Um, he was knighted for his services to the crown, and ladies and gentlemen, he was the motherfucking president of the Royal Society for 41 years. Let's give it up for science. Thank you. Right? Okay, so this is the kind of guy you want to meet if you're jonesing for a position in the higher-ups, because he's super connected and can totally get you that sweet Kush government job, right? No. <laughs> uh, our man Banks has a totally different idea because he's also part of this secret club in London society called the Association for Promoting the Discovery of the Interior Parts of Africa. It's way easier to just call it the African Association and I didn't make that up. That's what it's known on the internet too. Uh, this is basically just a club of 12 fancy guys in London who hang out because they want to discover the origin and course of the Niger River and the secret location of the lost city of gold, Timbuktu. It seems like a weird thing to bring people together. I think especially fancy rich people who could get together because they really like discussing champagne or <laughs> cigars or whatever. But these guys are really moved by this goal because they believe that in the age of enlightenment, in a time when people can sail around the world, we're talking about the late 1700s here, there is this big gap in knowledge. Um, the maps of Africa are frankly quite shitty at the time. <laughs> They're pretty much guesses as to where the Niger River is and um, they really don't know very much about what they term the dark continent. So, um, kind of like SpaceX, they decide they're gonna self-fund some exploration, because uh, rich dudes can do that, and they all throw five guineas into the mix. And if you're curious about old-fashioned money math, like I am, that basically works out to be about $1,000 a year, give or take, which is enough to fund hell of explorations into the dark continent to try to solve these deep and burning mysteries of the origin and location of the Niger River and Timbuktu. They send a bunch of guys out there. Do you guys want to hear how it went? Yeah. All right, I'm going to make this super simple. Here we go. The first one, John Ledyard dies in Cairo. Second one, John Lucas, Simon Lucas, 
gives up entirely. Daniel Houghton, starved in the desert. Mungo Park, he went twice. The first time he was robbed, <laughs> the second time he was drowned. Third one, Frederick Hahnemann disappeared. Nobody heard from him again. Henry Nichols died. And then we get to our hero, Louis. Louis. Um, now, <laughs> I don't want to foreshadow here, <laughs> but you probably can figure out where this is going. Because <laughs> there is a long history and legacy of death in the deserts. And part of this is because these people from the dark continent do not want to get fucking discovered by Europe. That is not of interest to them. Um, slavery is still going on right now, and they have a healthy distrust for Westerners. Also, it is not a place where you're going to get the red carpet rolled out, no matter if you're associated with slavery or not. So it gets this nickname of the Forbidden Desert. And the Royal Society is just passing out cash to try to get people to go in, no matter if you're qualified or not. Enters our man, Louis Buckhart, who I will remind you knows more about silk ribbons than most people <laughs> and has a degree in philosophy, which doesn't help you get a government job in London, apparently. But I don't know, is something that he knows about more than exploring the desert. And apparently the the Royal Society has realized, thanks to all this experience, that maybe they need to equip their folks with a little more than a few guineas in their pockets. So they send Louis Buckhart to Cambridge. Do a few free prereqs, if you will. Uh, they give him three tasks. They want him to learn the language of Arabic so he can communicate. That's important. They want him to learn science, because that's what the Royal Society <laughs> is into, and us. Uh, and they want him to learn medicine because they don't want him to die. So <laughs> that's what he does in Cambridge for two years. And then he heads to Aleppo. And if this were a movie, we would totally break for some catchy music and a little montage about the spy school that he's going to. Because at this point, Louis Buckhart starts to adopt Arabic garb. He starts to speak solely in Arabic. He makes friends with his teacher, who's a Christian Muslim. And they apparently smoke something called a Hubble Bubble together. The internet doesn't tell you anything about that. Sorry, guys. Neither does Louis Buckhart, but it was a thing. And they uh, really talk a lot about the Koran and about uh, local customs. And um, Louis Buckhart really takes all of this in and learns how to go under disguise as a Muslim in this part of the world. He even takes a code name. So he gets the name of Sheikh Ibrahim bin Abdallah. And he decides that for this journey he's going to take into the Forbidden Desert, he's going to live by this name. So he sheds his Swiss exterior, he takes on his chic exterior, and he decides to test out what he knows. So he leaves um, the safety of his now home turf. He's spent two years in Aleppo, Syria, and he heads on a little bit of a journey. So he, yeah, I wish that was the case, but this is the desert, guys. Sorry. <laughs> But I do not have high expectations about your knowledge of uh, pre-colonial Middle Eastern geography, so I'm here to help you out. He goes from Syria to Lebanon to Palestine to Transjordan. Got it? These are all tester rounds. Camels are the ships of the desert. I learned that here at Odd Salon. So, yes, we're all on the same page. He's basically traveling as... Um, not in a fancy fashion. He's hanging out with camel drivers. He's sleeping on the desert floor. He's uh, practicing his Arabic skills and really seeing if this is going to work. And it goes great. He totally fits in. And so he decides to go for real now. He's been training for four years. And he needs to make it across the Sahara out to Timbuktu and the Niger River. And the first stop on that journey is Cairo. So are you ready to go? Yes. That's Cairo. <laughs> I don't have any expectations. So um, on this first leg of his journey, he decides that he's going to um, trust his safety and security to a local governor by the name of Sheikh Yosef. This is early 1812, if that is something that you care about. And this gov is acting really concerned 
about our man's safety and well-being. And so just to help him out, he relieves him of most of his valuable belongings <laughs> and sends him on his way down south uh, with a guide who takes the rest of his belongings <laughs> and abandons him in the desert. And if this was anybody else, this would be the end of the story. But our man, Lu Louis Burkhart, he's fucking studied and is ready for this business. He finds a nearby Bedouin encampment. He uh, obtains a new guide. He makes some new friends and just keeps going. He persevered, if you will. <laughs> okay, so we're heading south. We're going through um, Transjordan. And on his way from Nazareth to Cairo, he's making friends, our Louis doing okay. And he talks with a group of traders. They've got some sheep, they've got some goats, they've got some gossip. And they tell him about a little place that's got some cool ruins that he should go check out down a narrow mountain valley. I don't know if you can see where this is going. There's a bonus to the story because the tomb of Aaron is nearby. And if you didn't grow up in Bible school, like me, I didn't know who Aaron was. He's the bro of Joseph, or uh, sorry, of Moses. So he's a pretty fucking big deal. And um, Louis acknowledges him as such and wants an excuse to go check out these ruins. So he's like, you've got goats. Aaron's a big deal. How about we go and we sacrifice a goat to Aaron and I can go check out these ruins. It'll be great. So he brings his guide and they head down this narrow mountain valley. And if anybody has been to Petra, this may look very familiar. Indiana Jones is also an awesome reference. <laughs> Absolutely, he went down this path. The date is August 23rd, 1812. And this is the first time since the Crusades that any Westerner has ever seen this scene. So this is what Armand Louis, Louis is most known for, but he doesn't get a chance to really soak in the glory because this is a place that has not been lost to the rest of history. The local people have known about it for forever, and they've just been keeping it a secret because this is a place that is very sacred to them. and. Westerners, Europeans in particular, have been known to make trouble. So they are very protective of this place. They're going to be really suspicious of anybody who's acting too wide-eyed and too curious. So he cannot act like I acted <laughs> when I went down this path and almost burst into tears. Um, instead, he has to play cool, go to that temple of Aaron, sacrifice a goat, pretend like that's his whole plan all along, and then just write hella notes that night after the campfire. Because on the very evening, he's on his way to Cairo. Uh, it was a little bit of a downer for him, but for the rest of us who know about this place, it's definitely less than a downer, <laughs> I guess you could say. Uh, so Louis Burkhart keeps going on his path. He's heading to Cairo, and his final goal is to cross the Sahara and to get to Timbuktu and the heart of the Niger River. But you probably need some company if you're going to cross the Sahara Desert, so he has to wait for a caravan going and nothing. Nothing is going. So he decides just for kicks to head down the Nile River uh, just to see what's going because he has nothing better to do. And ta-da, he makes another discovery. This um, is a very old picture of the sand-choked ruins of the great temple of Ramses II at Abu Simbel. So if you've ever been on a cruise down the Nile or if you've read Agatha Christie's cruise down the Nile death <laughs> story... <laughs> This is a place worth noting. It's definitely now a significant spot on anybody's trip to Egypt. But for that point in time, no Westerner, no European had ever heard of this place. So two points to our man Louis. And he's on a roll, so he keeps going on these journeys and next decides he's going to go for the big win and head across the Red Sea to Mecca. That's... That's kind of bold, let's be real, <laughs> uh, because this is something that no European is invited to. This is very much an exclusive party limited to people who are of the Muslim faith. And this is where our guy Louis runs into his first real challenges besides being abandoned in the devil desert. The first thing that I think of whenever I think of dysentery is all of those childhood memories of playing Oregon Trail. Um, 
But for a modern person, this is not as much of a significant roadblock as it would have been for somebody back in 1813, when dysentery basically is a really bad thing to run up against. But don't worry, our hero survives. And he makes it to Mecca, and he proves his credentials as a Muslim and is able to do the Hajj. And this is something that no European has ever been able to do. And he writes about his experience and shares it um, back in his homeland and makes some real moves forward in terms of the shared knowledge of the world. He um, keeps going because things are going great. A little side trip up to Medina to check that business out and E again. I know, really bad news, but our man Louis, he keeps on going. This is a bad case, but it takes him three months to um, get healthy again, but he makes it back to Cairo, trying to catch one of those rides across the Sahara with a caravan of traders, and there's nothing going. So he spends two years in Cairo laying low, waiting for any news that any traders are heading the way he's going because he really wants to do right by the Royal Society who've been paying his way for these last six years. Um, but, but there's no luck. And at the end of the day, Cairo is not so good for him. And yet again, dysentery strikes. And it gets him this time. Sorry to say, our hero of this story dies in Cairo on the 15th of October, 1817, and he's 32 years old. He spent the last eight years away from his homeland, making discoveries, sending back letters and journals for the Royal Society. He's never made it to the destination that he was seeking this whole time. He's never made it back to his homeland in this entire time. And he's never told anybody his real identity. He's buried in Cairo under his code name, Sheikh Ibrahim bin Abdullah. And that's where he remains to this day. But we know better. We know him as Johann Ludwig Louis Burkhardt, uh, the Swiss Sheikh spy with a daring desert discovery or few under his belts, one worth telling on this very stage. So thank you for joining me for Odd Salon tonight. <laughs> <laughs>